Good evening, everybody. I'm Andrea Miller. I'm the founding board member for Center for Common Ground. So thank you so very much for joining us tonight for our Road to the Midterms Looking Forward and Federal. Tonight, we have a very, very special guest, Congresswoman Johanna Hayes from the great state of Connecticut. You are also going to hear from one of our very new Democracy Center leaders, Dr. Lode Coleman, who is the new director in Hawkinsville. Before we start that, I want to take a moment to let people know where we are and what's going on with our work for 2022. This is the first meeting that we've had since our gala in December, and I am so glad that so many of you are able to join us. Right now, our plans for 2022 are that we will be working in the following states. Many of them you will remember from 2020. So Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, of course, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, Virginia, and a new state that we are going to add this year is Louisiana. And one of the interesting things about Louisiana is their federal election right now is scheduled for December. So yes, folks, it's going to be another very long year. Right now, our current active campaigns, we have phone banks running for the great state of Texas, who has their primary election on March 1. Right now, the phone banks are for voters who are over the age of 65, and we are calling them and giving them information on how to vote by mail. We are also working on building out our texting campaign for the great state of Texas. And again, that campaign will be for people over 65 and vote by mail. We will be transitioning right around February 1st to the younger Texas voters, and we will be working on early voting. Early voting in Texas begins on February 14th, and by law, most counties should have announced their early voting locations by February 8th. Some have already announced, so the counties will probably come up in the phone banks as they announce their early voting locations. So Texas is our very first state. North Carolina was previously scheduled to have their primary election in May. There is legislation before the North Carolina General Assembly to potentially move their primary elections to June. So in June, we will have South Carolina, possibly North Carolina, and Virginia. And so those are going to be what we are going to be working on right now and into the immediate future. We also are running a postcard campaign into Texas. We have identified 12 counties, 724,000 Black voters. So in Andrea, you just muted. All right, I just unmuted. So, all right. So anyway, what I was saying is we will be running all those campaigns. One campaign or new campaigns will begin as soon as we are done with an existing primary. 
So thank you all for joining me. And I'm going to turn it over to Gabe Wheaton for um, him to give an update on phone banking, how to do it, where it is. So Gabe. All right. Thanks, Andrea. So yeah, as Andrea mentioned, we are phone banking to Texas right now. Um, we're focusing on voters, black voters over the age of 65. And right now we're, we're looking at Bell County, calling into Bell County. Uh, but we have a bunch of other counties that we're going to start rolling out soon. And we're also focusing on, you know, a lot of the misinformation and, and shenanigans that are surrounding the um, vote by mail applications that I'm sure you've heard about um, in the news. Uh, all of the applications that are getting rejected right now through no fault of the voters, um, but because of the voter suppression laws that have been instated in Texas. So we are trying to give voters basically all the information they need to make their um, vote by mail applications least likely to be rejected. Um, but we're also going to start encouraging them to vote early in person if that's something they're comfortable with. Um, right now we're focusing on uh, 65 and up because you need to be over the age of 65 or have some sort of other special excuse like, um, you know, have a, a disability or something else like that. So we're, we're looking at that group and we are giving them the information they need to be able to vote early. Um, we're going to expand to all ages soon um, and we're going to talk about early voting and spread the word give everyone their locations their early voting locations soon so this and this is for the march 1st primary all um, right great and uh, i'm just putting the link to our phone making page in the chat uh whoop. let me send it to everyone and if you click on that you'll be able to see our upcoming um group phone banks that are every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, you'll be able to add one of your own if you have an organization that you'd like to start organizing phone banks with. Um, all the information is there. All right, are we good? Thanks, Gabe. Um, so I would like to introduce one of our newer Democracy Center leaders, Dr. Lodi, Coleman, who is the new director at the Hawkinsville uh, Democracy Center. She's actually a doctor and she does a lot of work around Black maternal health. So she's going to be talking to us about um, what we can expect or what happens with rural circumstances. So Dr. Coleman, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Again, I am Dr. Coleman, the director of the Dem Democracy Center here in the beautiful Hawkinsville, Georgia. Many thanks to you, Andrea and Josie, in her absence for organizing tonight's webinar and discussion. I am just truly humbled to be a part of this exchange. To start, uh, to Congresswoman Hayes, I am ever so grateful to you for your dedication and commitment to reproductive health rights and all you continue to do with the Black Maternal Health Caucus. In 2019, my organization published a groundbreaking piece of research identifying racism and benign neglect as a direct threat to public health. This catapulted a shift in the consciousness of the nation surrounding Black maternal mortality and ignited medical physicians around the globe to check their bias and hold themselves accountable for their mistreatment of Black birthing families. Certainly this was not enough, nor is this simple gesture remedy to centuries of medical misconduct and the heinous experimentations done on the minds and bodies of Black women. The core of the neglect and discrimination in Black maternal health identified in this research can be remedied effectively and efficiently through three pathways. One, to provide culturally unbiased access to midwives plus full spectrum support and care. Two, provide resources and funding to maternal health program initiatives, such as the mobile care units to reach families in the rural areas of the country where there is little to no access to an OBGYN 
and extend health care to cover, you know, cover families uh, through that first year of postpartum. This also includes more one on one prenatal care for black mothers that have experienced an undesirable or traumatic previous birth experience. I am so happy to say that since 2019, we all in the birth work field and community have been beating the proverbial drum and being the agents of appropriate change necessary to win the ears and hearts of Congress. I acknowledge and appreciate the great works of our representatives and this presidential administration in those efforts. The third prong to this trident, you know, if You've muted. Awesome. You awesome. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the third prong to this trident, if you will, is to establish affordable and professional midwifery education programs. This is in response to a call to action put out by one of our elder midwives in Atlanta uh, back in 2019, and that was to train 20,000 birth workers in 2020. <laughs> to meet this demand, uh, FTC Charity in partnership with the Newberry Institute developed an accredited direct entry midwifery certification program. This is essentially a four-year institution for less than $5,000 per person. Since this program's inception in 2019, we are changing the narrative and meeting the demand for training skilled workers as well as keeping this certification affordable for all persons to attain considering the racial wealth gap and inequities presented by Dr. Sandy Darity and attorney Antonio Moore. Yet, while we are training new and upcoming midwives and doulas, we must not forget the relearning that must be done across our medical industry. I maintain that if we could trust our medical providers to check their bias in the first place, black maternal mortality would not have spent the last 30 years in a state of crisis. As we move forward in this work, we must center healthcare providers and facilities with a history of racial discrimination against black women and mothers, birthing families, everyone, that they be required to re-educate themselves in the ethical and cultural protocols necessary for a meaningful and healing engagement with our mothers at each state of maternity. Far too long, our healthcare industry has been out of pocket. And because of this, our Democracy Center will host a 10 hour series entitled Ethics and Birth Equity Training with certificate for medical providers to address this matter. While we work diligently for inclusion and reproductive rights for all women, we must not forget the women, infants and birthing persons alike that lost their lives to a preventable condition at the hands of a racially biased provider. They are the reasons we are at this table having this discussion this evening. And for them and for y'all and for everyone here, I do thank you for your time and Godspeed. I yield the floor. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. And now Carol, I am going to invite you to introduce our very special guest. So I am Carol Rizzolo, I'm the Connecticut Coordinator for Center for Common Ground, a very proud supporter of Jahana, our, con our wonderful Congresswoman from the 5th District in Connecticut. Uh, I will keep this very brief. Um, Representative Hayes was elected to the US House of Representatives November 2018, making her the first African-American woman and the first African-American Democrat to ever represent the state of Connecticut in Congress. Hayes first served as she was, sorry, she served, she was selected as the Connecticut Teacher of the Year and then went on to become the National Teacher of the Year. In her capacity as National Teacher of the Year, uh, Ms. Hayes traveled the country and the world as an ambassador for public education, engaging all stakeholders in policy discussions meant to improve outcomes for students. She currently sits on the House Committees on Education and Labor and Agriculture is the chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Nutrition, Oversight, and, the, and Department Operations. Areas of legislative focus are equitable access to quality education, affordable health care, labor, agriculture, and the environment. 
Additional priorities are immigration reform, gun violence prevention, veterans issues, social justice, God, you've got a hand in everything, transportation, and working in a bipartisan way to bring positive change to the lives of every person in our community. Johanna, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce you to this incredible group um, and an honor to have you as Congresswoman in our state. So please go ahead, take it away. Well, thank you, Carol, and thank you for your persistence and making sure that I got in front of this group and for sharing your audience. Um, my real job when I am not moonlighting as a Congresswoman is a teacher. And uh, teachers know that you don't invite anyone into your classroom. As you can imagine, when I was named National Teacher of the Year, everyone wanted to come visit my classroom. And there were some people that I just said no, uh, because I didn't want them in front of my, my students. These were impressionable young minds, and it was my job to protect them. So I do not take it lightly when I'm invited to a group of people and your credibility is extended to me because this is your this is your classroom. And if you are inviting me in, it just displays a tremendous level of trust in me. So thank you, Carol, and, and for your just tremendous, tremendous support and the work of, you know, just making sure to uphold our democracy. As I was listening to you read that long list of priorities and legislative priorities, there's one word that just sums it all up and that's equity. My number one job is making sure that we provide access to all of these things to everyone, that we remove barriers, that we make sure that everyone can enjoy the fullness of the opportunities that we talk about. And the only way to do that, in my opinion, is to protect the right to vote to make sure that we can't talk about healthcare if, if the people who are at the table are not like-minded or aligned in our vision. We can't talk about education if you know the elected officials don't believe in education. And our performance evaluation, if you will, of our elected officials is to show up in, in every election and, and, and vote, you know, to, to grade them, if you will. Um, I, I know that in, in the, this environment of everything that's going on nationally with voting, I'm so incredibly just happy that you've taken a little bit of time to highlight the issue of maternal mortality. I think our work is cut out for us and that is gonna be a much larger strategy. Um, the one thing that I will say on voting just before I switch gears is you guys have been doing this work for a very long time. Uh, voting rights, protecting the right to vote has been at the center of your work for a very long time. And what I what I'm going to say respectfully as a member of Congress is don't wait for your elected officials to get it right, because I cannot guarantee you that's going to happen. It is going to take, you know, mobilizing voters, educating voters, registering voters, turning out people in, in massive numbers, because I, I fear that Congress will not act in time to protect the vote in this election. So it is going to be critical that uh, you continue to do the work that you've always done in this area because it's too important. Um, there is way too much at stake. Um, the issue tonight, uh, and thank you, thank you, Dr. Coleman for, for your words. It is so important. When I went to Congress, maternal mortality, more specifically black maternal mortality was not something that was on my radar or on my list of priorities. But as I think back over my own experiences, I realize that um, the rates of maternal mortality in the black community and even the way that women are treated by medical professionals, which contributes to that is unacceptable in this country. You can imagine I was a 17 year old teenage mom with very limited access to healthcare. My, in my campaign, in 2018, my, my support of and steadfast support for places like Planned Parenthood was not because of their abortion care, but because that was all my primary health care as a teenager. When I, I mean, it was where I found out I was pregnant. It was where I got maternal care. It was where I got follow-up care because I did not have a primary care physician and I did not have insurance. So when people look at these issues, we really have to expand their definition and perception of how they operate in our communities. You'd be interested to know that between 1990 and 2015, the maternal mortality rate increased by 
in my state of Connecticut, which is seen by many as a progressive state, if you will, four black women are four times more likely to die before, uh, uh, I'm sorry, black babies are four times more likely to die before their first birthday and two times more likely to be categorized as having a low birth weight. Nationally, black women are three times more likely to die in pregnancy related causes. These are not statistics that we should be reporting in the United States of America. I joined the Black Maternal Health Caucus very early on because as I started to look at the disparities in healthcare through a legislative perspective, this was an area that had the largest equity gap. And I don't think people think about this uh, in the way that they should. One of my first pieces of legislation during the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, declaring racism a public health crisis and reducing COVID disparities by investing in public health. And those, those two pieces of legislation were not based solely in racial or ethnic identity. It was based on the data. What I saw you know, in the, the early months and weeks of this pandemic was that black communities were disproportionately affected and my friends were dying when in the first couple months, people were talking about, they didn't know anyone who had been affected by COVID-19. I, I, I remember sitting one day and counting 18 people, 18 people in the first six weeks between my church and you know people I taught with, students, parents, in a very small community. I am from the city of, of Waterbury in, in Connecticut and it was one of the hardest hits at the beginning of the pandemic. But in the first six weeks, I could count 18 people who were lost. And when we started to disaggregate that data a little bit more, it, we started to see that, you know, these people had high blood pressure, diabetes, all of these pre existing health conditions that made them more susceptible to a global pandemic. So, racism is a public health crisis. And the same way that we look at that through the lens of a pandemic, we have to also look at it through issues like maternal mortality. On my role as the chairwoman of the subcommittee on nutrition oversight and department operations, making sure that kids have healthy meals has been the center of my work. I have fought relentlessly to make sure not only through this pandemic, but even in the months leading the time before it, that kids had meals. This should not be a conversation once again in the United States of America. One thing I can tell you that I know for sure is that hungry kids don't learn. I don't care how good of a teacher you are, how effective your resources are, how amazing and, and state of the art your building is. When you are coming off of a four day weekend and a kid has their head on the desk because the last meal they had was at lunchtime on Friday, it will break your heart. And I cannot occupy the space as a member of Congress and not address those things. Specifically making sure that we expanded meals through the pandemic so that kids could pick up meals and take them home, that we increased emergency SNAP benefits. But even in the area of maternal, maternal mortality, um, I introduced legislation, the WIC for Kids Act, to make sure that pregnant and nursing women could have access to healthy diets. These are things that are very easy to accomplish. You know, We can take a lot of small steps to address these issues. Uh, and make sure that they are legislated into law. I think the thing that I am most proud of in this area, and I have to give credit to one of my dear friends, um, Congressman Lauren Underwood, um, who is uh, one of the chairs of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, but uh, President Biden signed um, the Black Maternal Health Momnibus into law this year. And if you, I mean, if you guys have been engaged in this work, so people talk about omnibus packages, which are huge, huge legislative packages that just include everything. And this transformational piece of legislation, the omnibus, does that for uh, maternal health. It includes a mandatory expansion of year long post postpartum care. You know, we are one of, I think, six developed, six countries that does not have any family medical leave. You know, pregnancy is, is treated as a disability. Women are not given the time to nurse their children, not, not just women, families, birthing families, fathers, parents, you know, caregivers are not given time to bond with their children or spend time with them because it could affect their, their careers and their earnings. Um, 
this legislation would diversify mental health care providers, providing for doulas and in-home care and different services that many um, women previously had not had made available to them. It would increase training for medical schools and doctors and really focus on diversifying our medical professionals so that people who speak different languages or have different backgrounds or different cultural um, traditions would have you know, a healthcare provider who appreciated that and understood that it is a, an incredible, incredible, incredible piece of legislation. It includes digital equity tools. And all of these things that I'm talking about could not have happened if we didn't have representatives at the table who believed that it was important enough. So everything ties back to our fundamental right to vote and choose our elected Choose, choose our elected officials, because there are a lot of people who think that this is not important. There are a lot of people who think that our time is better spent and it is not the government's problem to protect the health and safety of our communities. I, I beg to differ. Um, it, my thing is just give people an opportunity, give people a chance, uh, remove the barriers. And I love uh, what Dr. Coleman said all of these things, for as much legislating as we do, for as much money as we invest, for all of the work that we do, none of that matters until we remove th those discriminatory practices, remove uh, the fact that medical professionals don't listen to women when they're saying, my body is, I know that something is wrong, that we are not putting in place preventive screenings, that we are allowing uh, insurance companies to decide the course of medical action. Um, it is just a heartbreaking story that Congresswoman Underwood tells how she came to this work because she doesn't even have children, but her college best friend died in childbirth. And it was something that was really hard for her to understand. You know, she is a nurse. Her friend was highly educated from a high income earning family. Um, her mother was highly educated and her doctors didn't listen to her. So you, if you can imagine, if the doctors are not listening to this woman who is highly educated, whose mother is a PhD, who is from a high income earning family, how do you think the conversations between my between 17 year old me and my healthcare provider went? So those are all things that we have to think about. And I am of the mindset that when you know better, you do better. And when you have the ability and the capacity to do better, then you work on behalf of other people. So I wanna make sure that no other woman, no other black woman, whether they're 17 or 37, has the issues that women face in childcare, have the issues that women face in prenatal and, and postpartum post, post, uh, care. All of the things that we talk about in this country, we have the ability to do them. Um, I, I mean, this can, I can go down a rabbit hole on so many other issues, uh, but I'll just leave it at, while we are, we are circling the drain on, on legislation like Build Back Better, trying to decide, is this worth it to spend this much money? Are we looking at the price tag and who deserves what? I remind you that our military defense budget has increased every year and even increase this year. Uh, and I'm not talking about the money that we spend on veterans and service members on military bases and schools and military healthcare and VA care. I am talking about defense contractors. So while we are talking about what we can afford and not afford, I promise you we can afford it. Our budget is a statement of our values and we have to decide where we value spending money and who, what communities of people we find value in and elect people to, to do that very difficult work. But I'm so grateful that in the context of everything that is going on, I know that um, it is very difficult for this group especially to have a meeting the day after the Senate voted down voting rights, voted down a rule change, to leave some space in the discussion for black maternal health. So I thank you so much. Um, and when you shift gears to your primary area of focus, I do wanna remind you of one last thing. While the entire country's focus is, is zeroed in on the two Democratic senators that did not vote in support of this legislation, I am beyond frustrated. I am my, I'm heart sick over it. Uh, but while my heart is broken, my memory is intact, 
because while we have two Democratic senators that did not vote in support of this legislation, we have 50 Republican senators who did not. And they are getting let off the hook way too easily. So I, I am prayerful over the year that you will have because if the last five years, 10 years, 15 years was difficult, uh, this is this is going to be this is going to be the year where where our work defines us and and I, I just know that um, you guys will do what you've always done. I, I don't know where you get the energy, the stamina, the time to write the tens of thousands of postcards that you write to do the education, to do the advocacy. But I can tell you, as the beneficiary of your work and your efforts. I, I am so thankful and I'm so grateful. And I recognize that someone like me doesn't get to Congress all by themselves. It is, it is you know, a million tiny drops from all over the country, from like-minded people who are aligned in their values and who are willing to do the work. Uh, and for that, I'm just grateful. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Carol, for, for your support and for bringing me here. And you know, thank you for, again, caring enough about this very important issue that we have the ability to do something about. You know, people always say, well, why you don't have time for this because we have these big problems. I tell you, if, if, if the world were perfect, we'd have one problem at a time, but we have to operate on many different tracks and many different lanes. And if we can save one mother or one baby or one family from, you know, the hardship that comes with with maternal mortality, it is our responsibility, every one of our responsibility to do it. So thanks again. Thank you so very much. The chat is blowing up with, not with questions, but people just so excited over what you were saying. So I am again going to invite people, if you have questions for Representative Hayes, please put them in the chat and then we will read the questions. Um, I have my own birth story. I have three children. The first two were born in the hospital with varying levels of um, major problems. They, the first doctor would not listen to me. So I required a hundred stitches. The second medical team, now I'm in actually another hospital, the same state. Again, they would not listen to me. And um, they basically nearly killed me, giving me a drug that I explained I was allergic to, trying to reduce my blood pressure, which kept going up because I kept trying to tell them, you can't give me this drug. I, you know what, I completely, I mean, I have so many stories. I remember, again, I have, and, and my children laugh at me because I had my daughter when I was 17, and then I have a son five, five years later, and then I have a 13-year-old. So I have been pregnant as a teenage mom. I have been pregnant as a working professional. I have been pregnant in a two-parent professional household. And my level of care was different at every stage. I remember a few days after I was uh, discharged from the hospital with my daughter, I started to hemorrhage. And I collected the blood clots in a plastic container and took them back to the hospital and said, something is going on. And was sent home on three different occasions only to find out that part of the placenta had not been removed. And that only happened when I got a massive infection. Everyone knows that it is not normal to have a grapefruit sized blood clot fall on your kitchen floor. And I was sent home um, as a, and I tell that story because as a two parent professional household, I wouldn't have left. I would have demanded to see another doctor, but you don't have that level of confidence when you go in and you don't know what your insurance covers, when you don't have consistent long-term care, when the only access to medical care is at an ER or a clinic, so your records are not readily available. As a 17-year-old mom with a problem, I just had to accept whatever information I was given because I was grateful for the access to that care. I realize today at this stage in my life that it is my right to have access to that care. 
there was no need for me to be grateful and accept what I could get. I had the right to ask the questions, to challenge the information, to ask for a second opinion. And I recognize that not everybody has that. And it is, it is unconscionable. I, I didn't realize when I said, when Carol was saying all of the things that are priority areas of focus for me, and I said the through line for me is equity, I never realized how disparate the impact on different groups was until I went to Congress. When you hear, I was in a, a, had a very limited scope, you know, talking to people in my community, people I grew up with. But when you zoom out and you have a national perspective and you see what is available to some communities, when you realize as a sitting member of con Congress that during a global pandemic, we have communities that have actually thrived and increased their wealth and other communities that have suffered and died, we have to do better here. Um, it, it just, it, it is unconscionable on so many levels, whether we're talking about education, food security, housing, healthcare, everything, all of these things are interconnected. And we, if we're not having honest conversations about how those equity gaps came to be, then we'll never be able to solve those problems. And then the other thing that, that I've seen is that when we do have those honest conversations uh, in, in an effort to be solution driven, some people interpret that as an attack. You know, I, for me to say that racism is a public health crisis, people, oh, this is divisive, you, you can't talk about race. No, I'm talking about science and data and statistics and facts. And we're seeing that one community is disproportionately affected in a way different from, you know, their counterparts. We have to address that and call it what it is. And, and we are at a time where um, it, it is uncomfortable to have conversations uh, that really call out things for what they are. And that's why it's that much more important to do it now. Doesn't mean that people um, uh, are responsible for it, but it means that we, ha we collectively have a responsibility to change it and fix it. So this is just something that is, it, it feels like it, it should be so incredibly easy. It feels like it should be something that Democrats, Republicans alike put a line around. It feels like for the party of life, that they would be championing life at every stage, you know, prenatal care, postnatal care, child care, you know, young adults, adulthood, and that's not the case. It is life when it is convenient. Um, so we, we, I'm just, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. You know, it, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't come to play a congresswoman. I came to use the time that I'm here. You know, I hear people say, oh well, you know, next Congress we have other things on the plate. Next Congress is not guaranteed. You know, five years from now is not promised. If we see an issue now, if we see a problem now, we need to start dealing with it and working on it now. Uh, Representative, um, we have a lot of our democracies and our leaders here tonight. Many of them are Black women. So I am just seeing all manner of wonderful comments. So democracy centers for us are in normally African-American communities where we have a lot of voters and normally 50% or more of the Black voters who are registered do not vote. So the goal of the democracy centers is to turn infrequent or non-voters into voting rights activists by explaining to them not the personality contest or the prom king, prom queen of elections, but Let's talk about the pain points in your communities. And I know in a number of these communities, this is a pain point. And then let's say and remind people, we're voting to fix this. So two keep things, your mind on the prize. Two things I wanna add there. So I can tell you that the conversation surrounding my healthcare changed when I found uh, a black OBGYN. It was just a different conversation. And I think that's why we have to diversify our medical um, professionals. I felt a lot more comfortable with her. She answered my questions. She acknowledged my pain. It was just a very different conversation. Um, I have 
actually I have two doctors. I have her and, and my other doctor actually is, uh, is an educator. He, he's a, a, a teaching doctor and he's a white man, but he, he has a, from an education perspective, but the two of them as a team really change my level, level of comfort with my medical care. And that's why we have to make sure that people can find diverse faces in their, in their medical care. The other thing I'll say to your point about um, black voters, my district, uh, you heard Carol say that I am the first African-American woman and the first African-American Democrat ever elected in Connecticut in 2018, which the first time I heard that, I said, that can't be true. This is Connecticut. And then I realized, wait, this is Connecticut. And the problem is that this happens in pockets where there's this level of perceived comfort that is not deserved. My district is less than 4% African-American. Uh, so the majority of my, my district, the majority of my constituents are white. We just had, I was looking through census data and the largest city in my district, which happens to be my hometown, 30% of the voting age population is black, but less than 2% of that population participates. So when you really start to dive into that data, if that population turned out in numbers, I could win the entire district, 41 towns. I remember at the beginning of my election, as I was calling delegates trying to get support, someone said to me, you're from Waterbury. The people in Waterbury don't vote. And he was a Democrat. And what I realized is that there are some Democrats who like to have these large African-American and minority populations in their district for apportionment for voting numbers. However, they don't want them to actively participate and feel threatened like you're poking a beast, a sleeping giant when you try to get these large African-American populations to turn out. Because if you look at the numbers, the people are there. We saw this happen in Georgia. We saw it happen in South Carolina. And there's almost a reliance on, no, I want you in my district, but I don't want you to vote every time. I don't want you to speak up on every issue. And I've seen that even amongst Democrats who are afraid of the power that is in the, vo that is in the votes of these unpredictable communities who st statistically and historically haven't turned out in every election, who are voting on the issues, not just along the party line, who want answers, who wanna see some diversity of perspective, thought and idea, and there are lots of people, Democrats and Republicans alike, who are not comfortable with that, that new approach, who are not comfortable with opening the door and letting everybody in. Uh, so we really have our work cut out for us, but there is so much power um, in, in the vote. There is so much power, so much untapped power and potential in the Black vote. Uh, and you know, you have to meet people where they are. I. And I know I'm all over the place. We're, we're switching from maternal health to voting, but there's so many there's so many nexuses here because it's important to know. And, and I think just to give you a little bit of perspective, Carol knows this. she's been on this train for a long time, but I didn't have the endorsement of the Connecticut Democrat Party. I had to run, I had to primary. And part of that primary process was me educating people on the process telling people if you show up and your name is not on the roll, ask for the moderator, telling people this is how you check your voter re registration, calling people the night before the morning of, arranging rides, all of these things to, people said, um, the black community, not people, someone said to me, the black community doesn't vote, young people don't vote, and my response was give them a reason. And I hope that that is your takeaway this year, give people a reason, educate them on their rights, on, on what it means, on, you know, how we can change the outcomes. You know, I think too many people think it's a foregone conclusion that these things, elections are decided. I can tell you with fidelity, I was a classroom teacher who had never run for any elected position, not even PTA, and I want a seat in Congress. So I know there is power in our vote. So again, I just thank you all for, for your work, for your steadfast leadership, for your willingness to, to, see things differently and, and force other people to see things differently. And, and I, I'm just so incredibly grateful. Um, and that is just, you know, putting up good candidates with good messages and good ideas. 
again, like I said, my district is 4% black. I couldn't have won this seat without a whole lot of really good people who don't look like me who said, you know what? That girl's, I'm with her. You know, those people got me elected and we can do that over and over and over again around this country. And, and I don't know if you're paying attention, but I know what happens if we lose these majorities. I know who steps into these roles. I know who takes over these gavels and this decision-making. I know who sits at the table in these rooms after the doors close. And there is too much at stake to, to this work is not for the faint at heart. It is not. So uh, this year, uh, I, I, I just am just so incredibly grateful for your work. You know, not everybody's going to put their name on the ballot, but everybody can do something to help in this process. And whether you're something is writing a postcard or poll standing or registering voters, every one of those activities is important. I, I want you to know that we have a group that I, I actually do want Andrea to comment on is Students for Justice because it is absolutely to your heart. And I just want to point out for folks, fit, didn't you have 50 students come back to work on your campaign? Listen to me. <laughs> Listen, it, it is amazing. Adults didn't want anything to do with me. They said, there's no way she can win. And it was the primary and it was in the summer. And I had students, my campaign, my original campaign was all kids. It was all high school students. It was all my former students. My original campaign ad was recorded and produced by my students. They created a, a donation link. We Googled how to build a political website. These kids, when I tell you, pay, ignore young people to your peril because they are willing to work. They are gritty. They find the information when they don't have it. And people thought I was crazy. They were like, you know, you're just playing with a bunch of kids all the time. And I was like, you have no idea what these kids are capable of. And when I tell you, our campaign headquarters, we had 100 people every day. I had kids driving back from college for the weekend to volunteer and then going back to school. It was, it was, you felt something when you came into that headquarters. And that really, I was so just humbled by the fact that for over a decade, I had taught these kids about the process and taught them, how, taught them as a civics teacher how they could impact the process so for them to come back and do all this work and see that it actually worked, a seed was planted in those kids that this country will benefit from for a lifetime because it was palpable. These kids are just amazing. And um, they have been just the, the, the wind behind my back and the oxygen in, in my campaign and really the purpose for my legislation because if, if we build them up, then all of the broken pieces and the mess that we have left behind, they will fix. I've seen what they can do. So I, um, I, people said, oh, you're so naive. You know, you have this Pollyanna view about kids and young people and what they can do. And I said, okay, wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> all right. Yes, yes. And, and it worked. Um, 2022 will be our third year of running our Students for Justice program. So they postcard, they make videos. And in 2020, which was our last federal year, we sent 9.4 million postcards to voters. They do we everything. Spent, they do right. everything. Yes, 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 yes. And they're, they're young and they're enthusiastic. They still so believe. So that was great. They still and, and everyone thinks we are insane because we work in the South. Well, in 2017, when everyone said it wasn't possible, we won Alabama. <laughs> we, in 2018, we sent three women from Virginia to Congress. And in 2020, um, I didn't believe it at first, but a friend of mine in Georgia begged us to turn our sights on Georgia, so we did. Well, and that's a great point because there's a bunch of obvious places, but then there's a lot of not so obvious places. Like I said, Connecticut had never sent a woman of color to Congress, which was crazy to me the first time I heard it. And what I've seen is that, you know, the Republican party has put their sights on all of these sleeper districts. 
You know, these quiet places, everybody's looking at places like Georgia, everybody's looking at South Carolina, Alabama, Deep South, all these places. So this, the strategy is, um, while, while everybody's looking over there, let's focus our attention in some of these other places. So we have to make sure that we are persistent and diligent in all areas. No area is safe. You know, there is no community where we should not be promoting um, voter education, uh, registering people to vote. In my state of Connecticut, we don't, need, we don't have no excuses absentee ballot. The pandemic was the first time that people in Connecticut were able to vote without a reason by absentee ballot. We don't have early voting here in the state of Connecticut. And people say, but it's Connecticut. Uh, we, we, we're working on that. <laughs> but I'm saying people think that, well, no, Alabama is the only state that has that kind of an issue. There are lots of places that have similar issues and it really is going to take for at every level, from the local level to the state level to the federal level, to make sure that there's uniformity in the access to, to the ballot. And I think that's what we were trying to do in Congress. But in, until that happens, we have to keep driving it home at the local level. And then I've got a couple of health care questions in the chat. Uh, many low-income people are still unable to obtain health insurance. Those making less than $30,000 a year are getting insurance quotes for $500 a more or month, a month. What can be done about that? <laughs> we need Medicare for all. We need Thank you. Need everyone to have health care. There should not be. I mean, it, it is, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. Just in this country that we are still having these discussions and conversations about health care. It is crazy to me that in Congress, there are members who are still fighting against lowering the cost of prescription drugs. It is crazy to me that the argument is still being used that it would reduce competitiveness. When I know and I see that this money is being being used for stock buybacks and to increase profits, you know, what, we just were on a call the other day, and I found that, and it was mentioned that um, on a caucus call that the pharmaceutical companies pay no taxes on their advertisement. You can't turn on the TV without seeing an ad for uh, a drug, six billion dollars a year, and they pay no taxes on that. It is crazy. Um, Healthcare is, is a monstrous issue that we need to tackle. And if, we, if we're breaking it apart in chunks, if we're doing it, I, I, I think that with the, with the Affordable Care Act, that was a start and we should have continued on a trajectory moving into the direction where people could have, have access to affordable health insurance. And it feels like it's two steps forward, four steps back. But uh, that is one of those things, I mean, in my husband just retired and his decision to retire was based on the fact that he would have lost his health insurance in the next contract. People should not have to make life-changing decisions based on their health care provider. So that is something that I will continue to champion, uh, continue to work for. We've done a really good job in Connecticut with our um, Access Health CT um, with providing, you know, we gave some relief for premiums and coverage during the pandemic to just try to continue to extend those things. But again, it goes back to who is at the table, who are our representatives. We still have representatives in Congress who are voting against measures like this, whether it be Medicare for all or anything to lower the cost of prescription drugs or expand access. And you have to ask yourself, what is the benefit of that? So you know, every state has to consider this a major issue, especially as we come out of this pandemic and really um, hold elected officials accountable and make sure that this is an issue. When I used to teach um, civics to my kids, every time we'd cover an election, we'd look at the issues. And I remember one year, my students asking me, how come Social Security and Medicaid is, is central to the issues list in every election? I said, because that is a reliable voting block and elected officials know that I'm not winning this election unless I'm talking to that group of people. If young people, if baby boomers, if all of these other constituency groups become reliable voting blocks, the conversation will shift and it will be very, very different. And I think that's what needs to happen. 
you know, we, we in Congress are always talking about expanding and protecting Medicare and Medicaid. It, it, it's, there's never a discussion about cutting it, about taking it off the table because it's too important. So we have to make sure that we're expanding that conversation to every other constituency group. And, and the way, the, the thing I've learned in my very short time as an elected official, you wanna, you wanna get an elected official to sit up and take notice, threaten to vote them out of office. Right. I, I like that to one. Fire. Every legislative <laughs> advocacy letter we send, we say, as a voter in your district. Yeah, um, fire them. <laughs> Uh, another question, how can we work to spread racial equity impact discussions through all legislative actions? I'm sorry, say that again. How can we work to spread racial equity impact discussions through all legislative actions? Choose your representatives wisely. I say, we, we, when we talk about, when I used to teach about the House of Representatives, I used to tell my students, this is the people's house. And in the people's house, every single person, no matter what your background, your socioeconomic status, your religion, your race, your ethnicity, you should be able to find some member in Congress who you can identify with. You should be able to have someone who you know when the door closes, that person is talking about the things that are important to me because that person is similarly situated. And we need a diverse body. We need a diverse body. I, I'm sure that many, I'm sure that you can feel the difference in the way Congress is legislating. And that is because of the people who are at the table. It is no accident that there are, is more legislation direct, directed at children and education because there are more moms in Congress than ever before. It is no accident that when we were uh, discussing the original CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, that education was centered as a priority and not just because it was, it was impacted by the pandemic, but because we had people in the room, because I was in the room. You know, it, it got to the point where every time I raised my hand to speak, uh, Speaker Pelosi would say, let me guess, it's about education. Actually it is, actually it is, because this is the one I know. And by, by having these robust discussions with people from different backgrounds, you know, the fact that this is the first time ever in history where a representative was approved to wear a hijab on the floor. We have Muslims in this country. That shouldn't be something that had to be made in special order. You know, the fact that we are legislating differently and having these racial equity conversations is because of the people at the table. You know, we are having conversations about uh, tribal education because we have Native Americans in Congress for the first time. We are having just in-depth, expansive conversations about LGBT, LGBTQ plus community, because we have people in Congress who identify openly as members of this community who are saying, wait a minute, this is what my community needs. And, and that's how we thread that line of racial equity by, it is, we are not a monolith, you know? And one thing I noticed when people said, um, uh, and, and Democrats are terrible at messaging, but it's a lot more difficult to, to have a, a unified message when you have a big tent that represents so many people. When you, when I look across the room and everybody looks the same, sounds the same, uh, has the same ideas, it, it's a little bit easier to be unified. So, you know, I will take this, my caucus for all our quirks and all of our differences and all of our um, outliers and, and just, variety of diverse people because that is more representative of my community and I can tell you when we close the door and we have a caucus meeting the issues that are brought up in that caucus meeting are the same issues that I hear when I come back to my state when I'm out in my community and these, many of these issues are things that I would have never known but for the fact that I have a member of congress who says no I worship at a synagogue so let me tell you how this is impacting my community so representation matters you know, not just in what goes in, but in the legislation that comes out. And if you want to ensure that equity stays front and center, then you need to make sure uh, as voting members in your respective states that you are sending people who value the diversity of your community and are not trying to, to dismiss it as being unimportant. 
And I've got another question right along the same line. People are really tracking here. Can there be an increase in money for education, especially in the medical fields and especially for African-Americans, Hispanics, where there is little or no funding and or one of the other things I see, people just don't know where to go. Actually, there is legislation. We uh, actually in the Momnibus, I, I believe there's 15, I, I have to get the number to you, I have to get the exact number, but there's money in the Momnibus, not only for uh, diversifying the medical profession and hiring and training more educators, but also for bias training amongst existing educators. Uh, in the last Congress, we passed unprecedented funding for HBCUs. The majority of our um, minority medical professionals come out of HBCUs. Uh, I, I think it was something like 60% of dentists graduate of, of minority dentists graduate from HBCUs. So really recruiting, training, but also even before college, investing in STEM education at the high school level, getting young people interested in, in professions and fields that they think are out of their reach, exposing them to opportunities uh, in the medical profession uh, that extend beyond being a nurse's aide or a home health care professional. There are so many young people who would be amazing, amazing, amazing medical professionals professionals in their community and lack the confidence to even take that leap. So investing in them earlier, giving incentives for returning to work in, in marginalized and disenfranchised communities, uh, for recruiting and training uh, people with uh, multilingual backgrounds. Um, we, during the pandemic, my office worked very closely to help expedite visas for many of our doctors who were, who had difficulty. You know, part of the, these are, we have to approach these, these problems from every avenue. It's not just um, throwing money at universities or providing scholarships and grants. It is reforming our immigration system to make sure that we have professionals who, who want to work here in this country very, with very specific skill sets that have the ability to do that. You know, when people talk about our immigrant and migrant workers, it's a very limited scope of the work they do. Some of, we have brilliant scientists who are licensed in other countries who want to work in the United States of America. And we have put up uh, barriers to those work opportunities. So really just having a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach to diversifying our profession and bringing people in and putting them in the communities that need them most. One of the things that, and I can tell you, you give me two minutes on any question, I'll bring it back to education. I will bring it back to education, but I can tell you one of the things that was frustrating for me when I was named the National Teacher of the Year, one of the very first things my administrator said to me is, I could have you know, an all advanced placement schedule with the, all the honors kids. And I said, this is part of the problem. You take the best teachers, because I was a good teacher. I was a really good teacher. I loved my work. I was super invested. And every administrator I have proposed to me, we can give you all of the highest performing classes. And I said, no, absolutely not. So up until the point where I left my classroom, I had two special education co-taught classes. I, had, uh, I did have one advanced placement honors class, but my other three classes were all what we would have would, would have been identified as our lowest performers in the school because those kids, in my opinion, were the ones who needed the strongest teachers the most. And that's what we have to do. We have to invest in our schools and our children and stop reserving access to opportunity for a select group of people. Thank you so very, very, very much. Um, it is eight minutes after nine. It feels like it's only been five minutes. So Carol, 
Thank you for offering to reach out. Representative Hayes, I am going to offer you the ability to let us know whenever you want to come back and you want to educate us on maybe a piece of legislation so that we can work with you to try and get it passed. That will be on our C4's eye, but we are going to be more than willing to do that that. I want to let everybody know that if you RSVP, you will get an email tomorrow or maybe on Monday that will have the link to this recording on our YouTube channel. The chat has just been amazing. You can save the chat by going into chat and then the little button, the three dots on the right, you can click that button and you can save the chat. You can also save our transcript by going to view full transcript. It's on the three dots next to apps and then click save transcript. So all of the incredible notes, um, people want you to run for Senate in Arizona. They want you to move. They want you to run for president. So there's a lot of requests that you might not be able to exactly handle and respond to tonight. But again, a lot of work left to be done in Connecticut's fifth district. But can I, I will just say one thing, if I can leave you with something. One of my biggest takeaways as a member of Congress, because again, I identify as an educator. I was never an elected official, never had any desire to be an elected official. And one of the things when I even went back to my teacher friends and I said, listen, I'm running for Congress. I really need your help. I'd love your support. And so many people said, I don't get involved in politics. And that has stuck with me because especially now people say, you know, politics is divisive. I don't get involved in politics. I really need for people to understand that the work that we do is not politics, it's policy. Every day I take a vote on all of these issues that were brought up on the cost of prescription drugs, on healthcare, on education, on housing, on homelessness, all of these policy areas. So it, it, it cannot be dismissed as it's policy and I'm turned off and I'm, I don't wanna get involved because the thing is, I take that vote with or without your input. You know, if the people in my district decide I'm not going to pay attention to what my congresswoman is doing, I'm turning off the TV, I'm not watching the news, that's fine. But I still get called to Washington to vote on that issue. And if I'm taking that vote in a vacuum without hearing from my constituents, then I am relying only on my information. So I really think that we have to educate people on the policy and, and really help people to remove, you know, partisanship policy, what's happening. Yes, there's a lot about that that I don't love, but I recognize that we have a system of government in which we elect representatives to take a vote on our behalf on the issues that are important to us. If we are not paying attention to the issues or we don't know what the issues are, then none of those things have a chance of surviving a vote. So I really just encourage you that this policy is, is what we're doing. You know, the, the way we get there might be different and that's where politics is involved, but people need to understand, you, you know, that these are policy decisions that are being made, you know, um, and, and that, that now is, I think you always hear, this is more important than it's ever been. This is more important than it's ever been. And that is very, very true. And another really important thing that I'm going to say as we close is my mother told me years ago, she said, if there is something that you want and you need, I was born into a political family. She <laughs> said, if you don't ask, it's on you. Absolutely. So we will be doing a lot of asking this year. We will be teaching people to ask. And I love that you're a civics teacher because we are developing civics courses for the nine states where we work to make sure people understand how government is supposed to work because what they're seeing on TV 
isn't necessarily what it was supposed to be like. No, and government does work. It it it, it does work. You know, um, I, Carol has heard me say this before. I know what happens when government works because I am what happens when government works. You know, I grew up in public housing, went to community college, uh, raised my kids very early on on food stamps and WIC and all these government programs. And at the point where I could stand, could stand on my own, I invested so much back into my community and became a contributor. So government works. It's about helping the people who need it most at the time when they need it. And then those people turn around and help the people behind them. And we just have to make sure that we keep systems in place that keep lifting people up and not closing people out. So again, just thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, Carol. This is this is the, the just the refresher that I needed, you know, because it does get heavy. This work gets heavy. So to be in a group and surrounded by people, even if for a brief moment, who still believe that it works and are willing to put in the work to make sure that it works is I think what we all need a dose of um, continuously. <laughs> and, and I agree. Thank you so very much. And everybody, I thank my democracy center leaders for joining. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, so very much for your opening words to all our democracy center leaders, to all of the national team, to all of our volunteers, and to all the people who may never have joined us on Thursday night before. Thank you all so very, very much. Now, next Thursday, Attorney General Eric Holder will be joining us. And that's going to be an interesting conversation regarding gerrymandering and some other interesting points. So I want everybody take care, take care of yourself and be safe. Good night.